Britain's new prime minister promises brighter days ahead. Liz Truss takes over from Boris Johnson after a divisive leadership contest. How will she confront the cost of living crisis at home and what will be her foreign policy priorities? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. Britain's new prime minister is taking over at a time of unprecedented challenges at home and abroad. Liz Truss is under pressure to act on the country's cost of living crisis. Families face soaring grocery and energy bills as inflation hits a 40-year high. She also needs to manage the UK's post-Brexit relationship with the European Union and the war in Ukraine. But her first task has been to form a cabinet. Truss promoted MPs who supported her during the leadership contest against Rishi Sunak. For the first time, the government's top four roles are not held by white men. Truss held phone calls with the U.S. and Ukrainian presidents before facing her first session in Parliament as leader. She's promising immediate steps to deal with high energy costs. We can't just deal with today's problem. We can't just put a sticking plaster on it. What we need to do is increase our energy supplies long term. And that is why we will open up more supply in the North Sea, which the Honourable Gentleman has opposed. That is why we will build more nuclear power stations, which the Labour Party didn't do when they were in office. And that is why we will get on with delivering the supply as well as helping people through the winter. Al Jazeera's Andrew Simmons reports from London. Liz Truss has had to hit the ground running both at home and internationally. Her first call with a foreign leader was with Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. She reassured him of long-term commitment by the UK in supporting the war against Russia. And she attacked Vladimir Putin, saying he was continuing to weaponize energy. Next came Joe Biden, the US president. He assured her that the special relationship with the UK would continue, and he thanked her for her commitment to the Ukraine war and to challenge Russian aggression. He went on to say, though, that the European Union uh, negotiations over Northern Ireland to get the legislation in place uh, had to be chased by the new prime minister. Domestically, she's got a major problem with energy prices, with the UK families, millions of them, really finding it hard going. She's going to announce in the next few days a new plan for capping the energy bills right the way across the country, uh, limiting them to below 3,000 US dollars in any given year. Now, this is a colossal commitment, over a hundred billion dollars uh, committed to it, which could actually threaten her whole mantra about cutting taxes, because somewhere that money has to be found, and it could be found in taxes for the future, and that could put her under threat. Well, let's bring in our guests now in London, Rod Decom, reader in politics at King's College London and director of the University Centre for British Government and Politics. In Cambridge, Lydia Prake, head of economics and at the New Economics Foundation. And in Brussels, Petros Fasoulas, secretary general of the European Movement International, which is a civil society network promoting closer European integration. A well, warm welcome to you all. Thank you very much for being on Inside Story. Uh, before we get into the nitty-gritty and the details of uh, domestic and foreign policy challenges, I want to ask each one of you first your general view of the new UK Prime Minister, your impressions, if you will, after her first speech. Rod, let me start with you. What did you think? Can she deliver? Well, that remains to be seen. I think um, one of the major issues Liz Truss has is that she's starting as Prime Minister under seriously unfavourable circumstances. So while it looks like she's um, on the face of it, uh, in a powerful position, she's got a large parliamentary majority. She can do pretty much whatever she wants in terms of legislation. She is in a politically very tricky position with an election looming uh, and her party plummeting in the polls. So I would suggest things are looking quite gloomy from her even from the start, uh, but it remains to be seen whether she can, can hit the ground running just as your correspondent said. All right, Lydia, your thoughts. Can she hit the ground running? Can she deliver? 
Well, it's going to be very interesting to see what she actually does, because obviously up until now, she's been trying to appeal to a very specific and quite small group of people, namely Conservative Party members. And now obviously she needs to appeal to the, the public at large. And we're already starting to see her pivot. So, for example, uh, the big emergency energy package that we're expecting tomorrow is, is very, very different to um, the sorts of things that she was talking about a few weeks ago. So I think she is going to have to backtrack on a lot of what she said in her um, Conservative leadership campaign, and it'll be interesting to see exactly what she does. Petros Fasoulas in Brussels, how does the rest of Europe view Liz Truss? What do they make of her vision of the UK? Well, after Boris Johnson's abysmal and after uh, comic premiership, uh, things cannot get worse as far as people here in Brussels are concerned. <laughs> Having said that, British politics have the tendency to surprise us, and they have done so over the past few years, especially since the UK decided to leave the EU. So people are uh, hoping for the best, but they are expecting the worst. OK. Rod, now let's get into the details of it. Of course, a long and costly to-do list for uh, Liz Truss. The most pressing issue, as we heard domestically, is, of course, to help people cope with a huge rise in energy prices, uh, the cost of living crisis. But this energy crisis, of course, is not just affecting uh, Britain, but the whole of Europe, given what's happening in Ukraine right now. Do you think Britain under Liz Truss is better placed to deal with it than other European countries? Uh, with the energy crisis? Yes. Oh, well, that remains to be seen. Again, we, we won't know until at least tomorrow some of the specifics of what Liz Truss is going to come up with. I think what we can say with some confidence is that this is the immediate battleground that she's facing. So we saw in Prime Minister's questions today when she faced Keir Starmer for the first time, uh, the question over precisely who is ultimately going to pay for and indeed benefit from Liz Truss's measures is the core battleground. Neither is giving way. I think Liz Truss is uh, immediately playing quite a big gamble uh, that she will be able to cut through to the electorate. Um, with, her, with her measures immediately. I think what Lydia says is absolutely true, by the way, I want to underline this, that she's at a very difficult point in that she's pivoting from talking to her own political party mm -hmm. to talking to the country at large and governing. And I think it's a difficult transition. What does the country at large make of her, Rod? Not just, you know, conservative voters, but, but all the, the country as a whole. What do they think of her? Well, notwithstanding the fact that she... Um, isn't hugely well known amongst the country at large, at least not in comparison to other kind of high profile figures. I mean, Boris Johnson was exceptional in his cut through to the country. Um, she, her numbers are not fantastic. I think, you know, in comparison to Keir Starmer on questions over, say, who would make the best prime minister, she is um, around 10 points down according to most measures. So uh, not fantastic at the moment. She's got a lot of ground to make up. All right, Lydia. Coming back to the energy crisis, one of the plans, at least until, you know, she was elected, seemed to be that there'd be some kind of freeze on energy bills. How, how will that be paid for and what will that entail? Yeah, so there's been a lot of rumour about how, how it will be paid for, um, you know, with some people um, suggesting that it might be paid for via loans mm -hmm. to energy companies, which would mean that um, because... Uh, um, energy companies would put up household bills then for possibly up to 20 years afterwards to be able to kind of um, recoup these costs. Um, it could mean prolonging the pain on households for quite a long time, although obviously reducing that pain in the near future, um, with a lot of people particularly criticising the fact that it doesn't seem like there are any plans to increase the windfall tax mm. on oil and gas producers um, to make sure that they pay um, as full a contribution as they're able to. So there's been been a lot of criticism of that and suggestion that maybe uh, it will be paid for via um, uh, borrowing um, uh, and thus future taxation. So that, I mean, that certainly seems like uh, potentially a more progressive alternative, because mm -hmm. as long as you've got a progressive tax system, um, uh, you know, at least it's, it, it, it is, the burden is falling more on the wealthy. Right. Um, but I would say, if she's going to be partially borrowing large amounts to fund some of the tax cuts that she's been talking about, right. um, that aren't going to be particularly helpful from a cost of living perspective. But I was going to ask you uh, about that. I mean, during the campaign, her opponent said that this would be political suicide, uh, electoral suicide. But yet here she is. Is this package of tax tax cuts that she's offering, that she's uh, announcing, uh, Lydia, is that is that going to help people with low incomes? 
No, I mean, they're all, all the ones that we've heard being mooted are all, I would say, fairly untargeted and um, are often going to benefit a lot of wealthy people who don't need the help. Um, or in the case of, for example, corporation tax, the uh, corporations that are, are, are making uh, profits rather than those that are struggling. So, um, no, the, the, the tax cuts, in my opinion, are a very, very poor use of borrowing. And this is, this is going to have to be a big support package. So having waste like that, um, you know, well, it's never a good thing, but it's a particularly bad thing in a time of crisis when a large rescue package is needed and may be needed for many years. And people are talking about this crisis going on until maybe end of 2024, mm. possibly longer. Petros uh, in Brussels. Liz Truss uh, and, the e uh, and the UK in general has worked well with the EU on issues like support for Ukraine, for example. The EU right now as a whole is trying to find common ground and means of stabilizing these energy prices across the block. Can they work with the UK on this? There is genuine desire uh, here in Brussels and in key capitals across the continent to cooperate with the UK because, as you pointed out, the challenges we are facing uh, are common and they require a joint reaction. Uh, which is why also it's imperative that uh, this trust, the new prime minister, uh, adopts a more conciliatory and constructive tone uh, during her election campaign, even though she was trying to appeal to a narrow section of the population. Uh, people were paying close attention here. Luckily, most speak English. And uh, describing uh, the president of France as possibly a foe uh, and also communicating uh, fairly confrontational messages when it comes to the EU uh, hasn't been helpful. That mm. has uh, really made people have uh, low expectations and it will make cooperation harder. So it's imperative that uh, uh, soon uh, Liz Truss uh, communicates uh, messages that are based on uh, the need to build mutual trust because uh, in her previous roles in the British government, certainly uh, she was perceived as uh, quite hostile towards the European Union. Rod, which version do you think the uh, which version of Liz Truss do you think the European Union is, is going to get? Her critics say that she's cleverly used opposition to the Northern Ireland Protocol and and the EU itself to garner support within the Conservative Party. Do you think she'll dial down the temperature now that she's been elected? Yeah, I, I do think that's likely. I mean, I think, you know, Liz Truss uh, is no longer campaigning. She's going to be confronted by the realities of government, but particularly the realities of government in crisis. I think her options are going to be seriously limited. She will have to, I suggest, adopt a more conciliatory tone. Uh, it'll be interesting to see exactly when that happens. I suspect not immediately. I think um, once the political costs of uh, such a strident position uh, towards Europe um, become apparent, I think that will be when you see the tipping point. But yeah, I think um, if nothing else, Liz Truss is a flexible politician. I mean, we can say this with certainty throughout her career. You know, she has changed positions um, openly, uh, re repeatedly. So I think, um, yeah, absolutely, we'll see a, a very different kind of figure. Do you agree with that, Lydia? I mean, she was very tough with the EU during negotiations for, for Brexit. She was a tough negotiator, confrontational even at times with Brussels. Are we going to see continuity when it comes to, to Brexit or are we going to see a change as uh, uh, Ron thinks? Well, I, I, I certainly hope that we will see a change because I think, you know, uh, Everybody loses from the current uh, you know, situation with regards to Brussels. The UK definitely continues to suffer. So, for example, if you look at something like business investment, it's been down since the Brexit referendum. It's still down. And a, a lot of that is, is to do with the uncertainty and so much of um, you know, the Brexit negotiations still to be worked out. So, you know, we're already paying the price. Plus, you know, like, like others have emphasized, you know, while the UK may literally be an island, we're, not, we're certainly not economic in Ireland. And I think we're going to see this actually over the winter. It's going to be really hammered home to the UK because obviously the EU has, has big problems potentially coming this, this winter with, um, with energy short at, shortages, possibly blackouts, etc. And that's going to have lots of ripple effects for the UK economy through supply chains because our, our economies are, are, are so interlinked. Um, so I think it's going to be, yeah, I, I, I very much hope to see this trust working in a, in a much more um, constructive way. With the European Union. Petros, on, on the Northern Ireland Protocol, which has been really at the heart of the, the, the dispute with the, the European Union, uh, where, where do you th see things going and what sort of flexibility is there from Brussels on this issue? Are they likely 
to give, give up a little bit uh, just to be on the same page as uh, Liz Truss and the British government? Mm -hmm. Both uh, the EU leadership, the EU institutions, but also key prime ministers and heads of state in uh, most member states have said that uh, there is, of course, desire to work out any difficulties that might emanate from the protocol, but there is uh, no appetite to renegotiate, uh, reopen this agreement. Um, people here are uh, conscious uh, how difficult the negotiations were, mm -hmm. uh, how difficult the issues that we needed to go, to address, and they don't wish to go back uh, to the start and negotiate again. There is appetite to find solutions to difficulties, uh, but that appetite needs to be reciprocated. We, mm -hmm. London needs to demonstrate its desire to first and foremost respect the agreements that it has signed up to, and then constructively, not uh, with brickmanship, in mind, uh, engage into finding solutions. And unfortunately, uh, we have seen uh, successive prime ministers uh, from Cameron all the way to Liz Truss uh, preferring to adopt um, a confrontational stance, mm. not appreciating reality, as, as it was said, but actually being victim to ideology and dogmatism when it comes to dealing with the EU. And that doesn't play very well over here. As you alluded to earlier, during the campaign, uh, when she was asked about future relations with French President Emmanuel Macron, she said that the jury was still out. Do you think that was a diplomatic mistake? Do, do you think she'll change her attitude when dealing with other leaders? Certainly it was. It was in diplomatic language, let's just say that. And it raised a lot of eyebrows because even if you're in an election campaign, even if you're trying to uh, appeal to the galleries and get a cheap laugh, uh, you, are, you, know, you are rehearsing to be a statesman, a prime minister. And this is not the kind of language, certainly not the kind of tone anyone should adopt that aspires to lead a nation like the UK. So it, it has left a, a sour taste in the mouth among people over here. Uh, but, but nevertheless, you know, they're grown-ups. They have a uh, uh, hard skin. And as Mr. Macron, President Macron demonstrated shortly after those statements, uh, he didn't take it personally. There is genuine desire to engage and work together with, uh, with Britain. And, and the hope is that they, um, there will be maturity. People will, will grow up and, and engage as adults. All right. Rod, I want to come to you and talk uh, about another domestic issue, and that is, well, domestic keeping the union together, Northern Ireland and Scotland threatening to break away. Will she be able to do this, to keep the union together? Uh, well, that's one of the big questions. I mean, certainly it's going to be high on the agenda. I think the Scottish National Party particularly see an opening mm -hmm. with the Liz Trust Premiership. We can expect to see pressure coming from them. I think uh, the one of the reasons why it's less likely in the immediate future is that none of the major parties uh, see it as a, a, a politically uh, viable policy tool. I mean, it's very unpopular, I would suggest, at least in, in England. And so, yeah, not immediately. I think we can see uh, it starting to rise on the agenda. I think, I suspect, it's going to be buried by other things. Mm -hmm. And let's look at Liz Truss's inbox. I mean, it's probably the worst inbox of any incoming prime minister uh, in living memory. You know, you've got the cost of living crisis. You've got a, a collapsing NHS. You've got... Uh, the ongoing uh, uh, war in Ukraine. There's so many other things I think are going to squeeze it out. So I think it will be an issue, but not until probably after the next general election. That's going to be key. Not in the immediate. Uh, what about her ability to reunite the Conservative Party? Well, this is the, uh, the question. Her cabinet uh, has not, I would suggest, been designed uh, to uh, reach out mm -hmm. to her critics. Uh, she's very much been promoting people who kind of stridently supported her uh, from primarily the, the, the right wing of the party. Um, her job will be to kind of secure a broad coalition mm -hmm. within the parliamentary party. I think her first appearance in parliament did that to an extent. She landed a punch or two on Keir Starmer. The question will be, once she gets into the first couple of weeks, couple of months of her premiership, Will she be able to keep that going in the face of a seriously perilous electoral situation? Right. I would suspect she'll find it very, very difficult indeed. Lydia, as you talked about, and this really seems to be uh, high on the agenda for her, at least her foreign, foreign policy vision, it seems, will be focused on boosting the British economy, right, as you said. So do you, do you then expect any changes diverging from Boris Johnson's government at all. On China, for example, we've got Kwasi, uh, 
Kwarteng as a new chancellor, what changes do you expect to see, or are we going to see continuity when it comes to economic policies and relationships with China, uh, for example, trading partners? Yeah, I'm not, I mean, to be honest, I've, I've, I've not seen an enormous amount of kind of rumor and intel on that front. So mm. I'm not sure. I mean, I think the jury is out to see what she actually does. But just to kind of go back to the previous point about will she be able to um, unite the Conservative Party? I think, you know, from an economic perspective, it's going to be very interesting, because obviously, lots of the tax cuts that she's advocating, there's a large number of Conservatives view as being very inflationary. Um, also, because she's committed to these tax cuts, she's going to have to fund her big rescue package through large amounts of borrowing. And a lot of Conservatives are going to be are going to view that as being very, very un, um, unconservative. Mm. So I think she's got an enormous challenge to um, to bring the Conservative Party together on some of the, the big kind of economic changes that are going to happen, because it's going to be a, a very different Treasury to the Treasury that was run under, under Boris Johnson. All right. So you think domestic issues really are going to be her focus uh, as she starts her term as uh, Prime Minister. Let me come to you now, um, Petros, in Brussels. As a Foreign Secretary, she promoted global Britain, seeking to strengthen the UK's role in international politics. How did she do then, and how do you think she's going to do uh, taking the UK heading under her leadership? Where is she going to go on issues like China, for example, Ukraine, the relationship with Russia? There is a contradiction in the ambition to for global Britain and the distance that uh, Liz Truss and others in the Conservative Party have taken from their closest neighbor, their more intimate trading partner in the European Union. So the, the, the road to global Britain certainly goes through Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if Liz Truss is to be true to that ambition, uh, the first thing that it should do is ensure close and constructive relationships with the European Union and key European nations. Uh, and her record up until now has been relatively poor, as that of the Britain as a whole. Uh, hardly any trade agreements. Uh, any trade agreements that uh, the UK has actually signed were just rolling over existing agreements that the UK enjoyed as a member of the European Union. And those new trade agreements uh, were far from uh, uh, beneficiary for the UK itself. So uh, her record was poor. And if she is to continue down this path, uh, this intellectually dishonest, in effect, proposition that uh, a global future exists far away from its closest neighbor and trading partner, then I don't expect much success. The key is in re-engaging with the European Union constructively, mm -hmm. uh, building a closer economic and political relationship, uh, because our challenges are common, and only joint solutions can actually uh, get us out of the current geopolitical situation that we are in. Rod, uh, in London, what about the so-called special relationship with the U.S.? Uh, President Biden has been critical over the Northern Ireland protocol issue. Where, where do you see the relationship with Washington heading? So, um, continuity primarily. I mean, Boris Johnson uh, always you know, pursued relations with, with America with great vigor. I suspect Liz Truss is going to do the same, in part because it signals a break uh, uh, with Europe. It signals an alternative. I think you're right. I think I don't think it's going to be reciprocated uh, to the same extent from the US, at least, at least not because of Northern Ireland Protocol, mm -hmm. um, at least not until that issue is resolved. I think, however, it's, it's going to be one of those things that will be in the background, will be one of the many competing issues for her agenda. I think she's going to be, honestly, the first couple of months dealing with crisis after crisis. This won't be one of them, I would suspect. All right, a long to-do list at home, for sure. Thank you so much for a very inter interesting conversation. Thank you to all three of you, Rod Decom, Lydia Preek, Petros Fasoulas. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fuli Batibo, and the whole team here in Doha, thank you very much for watching. Bye for now.